Hello, everybody. We are on to the last chapter of our class. This is lecture 28, the first lecture on chapter 7, which is going to introduce you to radiation therapy and radiation safety. Uh, while the last chapter we got done with chapter 8 was probably the most difficult chapter of the entire book, chapter 7 is the most important by far for a practicing medical physicist. Uh, a good number of the people who come through our medical physics program in the department are going on to careers in radiation therapy. These are the people who are delivering radiation to treat tumors and cancers. Basically, their entire job is going to be encapsulated in these last three lectures, Chapter 7 uh, of Kane and Chapter 15 of Hobby. So this is really important that you try to understand. You will see that the equations are minimal and the math is small, but the concepts are going to be very new. They're going to be difficult, but they're super useful. The reason our medical physics students, when they are going away from the University of Windsor and going to these other bigger schools are doing so well when they get there is because they've really understood and internalized these concepts. You're going to see them first in 3700. Everything that we're talking about in this chapter is going to be reviewed again in 4700, the radiologic physics class, and dug into detail when I teach the radiobiology class. And then the imaging side will be taught in 4710. But when you go to graduate school for medical physics, for those of you who do that, you're going to have seen these subjects multiple times. And you're going to be sitting next to people, many of them who have never seen it at all. So are you going to have an advantage? Huge advantage. And our students are doing really, really well when they go away from Windsor. But it requires you to actually try to learn this material and to make some sense of it. Uh, and it's important because this is the whole basis for, you know, one of the uh, ways that we're currently treating cancer, that is having medical physicists apply radiation to a patient to kill the tumors. So that's the motivation for what we're going to be doing in our last three lectures. Super important stuff. Very, very interesting. Um, so let's get to it. And you had a reading from Kane, 7-1 and 7-2, and you had uh, a reading from Hobby. And today we're going to be going through a couple of these ideas. So I hope, as always, that you've done the reading beforehand. If you haven't, stop the video now. I'm not going anywhere. Read through these pages. Try to make some sense of it. Come back, and then let's you and I go through it together and see if we can make some sense of what you're reading. As always, I'd like to start off with some multiple choice questions. So let's get to that. All right, uh, I'm going to make this screen just a little bit bigger so you can see it. Maybe something like that. Maybe something like that. Okay. This is going to be one of the key ideas for the lecture today. I'm going to be talking about this a lot. You may not get it now because most students don't get this at the beginning. But by the end of this lecture, I really need you to understand this idea because it is critical. So Hobby had this plot, 15 figure 15.32. By the end of the lecture, you need to understand these ideas, and I need you to understand this figure. What this figure is showing is, according to Hobby, if a beam of 10 MeV X-ray photons, so MeV, 10 MeV is what we use mostly for treating cancers, 10 MeV X-ray photons of total of energy 1 joule, what I just made up that number, but it's, it's a lot of photons, but it's a nice round number, 1 joule. Many, many, many photons. It's incident on a 5 centimeter a thick slab of water. So, you know, your arm might be about five centimeters thick. Let's model my arm as a slab of water. That's pretty good. X-rays are coming in from one side. That's what's happening. What's true about the total energy transferred and the energy imparted to the entire five centimeter slab? Now, if you haven't done the reading, there's zero way you would know this. You would not know what energy transfers need you will not know what energy imparted means. That's why you've got to do the reading first. If it's just me talking, you're not going to understand it. You have to try to do this reading. And if you're if you're skipping the hobby readings, you're going to miss all of this. Because Kane, her, her description of this is not quite good, I think, in this book. So I have to refer to hobby a, a lot. So if you have not read it, please stop. Go back. Read that hobby selection. You even know what the question is coming. Try reading it now that you know what the question is coming and see if you can get it. So if you've done that, as always, I'm going to pause. You take a look at these questions. Write down your answer. There's just one answer that I'm looking for here. Write it down. And then when you're ready to hear the answer, unpause, and we'll go through it together. So I'll wait 
you can pause now. Okay, if you are back, you should have had one of the answers. Which one is it? Number four, the energy transferred is less than one joule, and the energy imparted to the water is less than the energy transferred. All right, and that's kind of being shown in this graph here. We are going to see that the energy transferred to the water uh, can't be less than one joule because a large number of those X-ray photons go through that tissue. They do not transfer their energy into getting ionized particles moving. All right, that's going to be the idea uh, of the of the energy transfer. Uh, energy imparted is what fraction of that energy that you transferred actually goes into absorbed dose which is going to be biologically affecting the patient. All right, it's never 100% because some of the energy that you transfer, energy transfer is gonna be getting the charged particles moving. Some of those particles move through and don't do anything. So the energy that you actually impart, which is dose, is less than that. All right, so that has to be true. At best, it could be equal to, but in reality, it's always less than it, a little bit. So. You probably didn't get this question right. Think about this question, and by the end of the lecture, would you be able to answer it correctly? I'm going to try to take you through this as you know rigorously as I can. All right, and if you'll kind of do the work with me, I think we'll be able to understand it. Let's try another question. Oh, there's this idea of something called LET. What is LET? Ooh, I don't know LET. If you didn't do the reading. You're not going to know LET. There's zero way you can answer this question. So again, go back and do the reading. Now, consider several different particles that all have the same energy. This could be, um, but they have different LET. So this could be uh, uh, just, again, one joule is a crazy amount of energy. Forget that. But assume I'm saying like it's a one joule alpha particle, a one joule beta particle, a one joule positron, a one joule uh, photon. They all have the same energy, exactly one joule, whatever it is. But they all have a different LET because they're different particles. According to Kane, which one of these following five things is true? And there may be more than one. All right, so I'm talking about how far does that particle travel? And I'm talking about which one does the most or least biologic damage. So take a look at those, and which do you think is true? As always, I will pause now. Okay, you're back. I'm sure you have some answer or answers written down. I'm wondering what you decided. Uh, I'm wondering out there how many of you thought that there were two correct answers, because if you did, you are correct, and you're probably cheering a little bit right now because you're thinking, oh, I got a chance of getting these right. Let's see if you got the two correct. It's two and four. All right, and these two and four are not random things. Four is caused by two. So two and four are both true. Two is what happens, and four is the result of that happening. All right, so LET is going to stand for linear energy transfer. It's the rate at which energy is transferred from this screaming charged particle into the tissue. It's going to lose all that energy. All the kinetic energy is going to go away, and it's going to dump it into the tissue. And if it's a large linear energy transfer, it's good at transferring energy, which means it loses energy fast, which means it skids to a stop quickly. All right. So if it skids to a stop quickly, all of that energy is deposited in a very small track. It travels the least far. And if all that energy is deposited in the least long track, that's where the most damage occurs. Right? All the energy is packed into a little area. All that tissue gets blown apart. If the same amount of energy is spread out over a large amount of tissue, well, then the, the damage is less. You can think of it as, and it's not a heat effect, but heat would do the same thing. right? So when you concentrate it in a small area, it does a lot of damage. So they certainly travel different distances, and by traveling diff different distances, they do different amounts of damage. So we're going to talk about this, and I hope that makes sense to you now that I've explained it to you. Okay, we have one more question coming up. So here is an x-ray machine. I am putting a beam of 10 MeV therapeutic x-rays. So again, 10 MeV is just a common number that I'm going to use. It's the energy of x-ray photons that we're using for treating cancers, mostly in the clinics. 
If it's incident on a slab of tissue, 20 centimeters thick, so it's zero at the front, 20 at the back, that's anterior, that's posterior, where is the absorbed dose to the tissue maximum? Dose is what you want to deliver to a patient. It's what damages the cancers. It's what kills the tissue. I've shown you the picture. It's on the screen. Where in that 20 centimeter slab of tissue is the dose a maximum? There's only four options, so that should be easy for you. I'm going to stop talking. As always, pause the video. Write down your answer to commit yourself to something. Not just, uh, let me just think that. Right, right, write it down. Commit. See what you think. Nobody will know. Unless you're going through this together, which could be great. And then we'll come back and we'll discuss why that answer is. So pause now. Okay, I've come back. So what did you think is the right answer? Where is the absorbed dose maximized? You might be inclined, if you have not done the reading, or if you've never encountered the subject before, as I was the first time I saw it, you would think the dose would be maximum right at the surface where the x-rays are strongest before they've had a chance to attenuate. But if you thought that, you would be wrong. You would be wrong. I'm going to refer back to this figure again. Absorbed dose. Dose is what damages tumors. Dose is the same as energy imparted. And the energy imparted are these open circles in this graph. And you can see the distance in water. So this question I got directly from this figure out of hobby. All right. The dose at the surface is actually quite low. So there's this idea that we're going to talk about today of a buildup region. The dose is low right at the surface. It, it seems contradictory. When the x-rays hit the skin, you would think, man, the dose is maximum right there. It's just not true. It's going to take a while for the dose to build up down inside the tissue. And so this is showing you on the screen here, the dose is maximized uh, some amount of distance within the tissue. Uh, for, for, in humans, to be honest, most of the time it's about five millimeters below the surface, but it definitely is not at the surface. In, in theory, directly at the surface, the dose is zero. Okay, and if that doesn't make any sense, then you're not thinking about dose the right way. So let's make sure you understand this by the end of this lecture. Remember, with an X-ray, therapeutic X-ray beam that hits some tissue, the dose at, right at the surface is zero, even though the X-ray fluence is highest. How can that be? That's the key idea for today, and we really need to understand that, okay? So we're going to work through that together, and we're going to try to get you into that. All right, so I'm going to go to a full screen on some of these PowerPoints to take you through sequentially the way I would like you to think about these things. So here's our introduction today. I'm going to start with something you've seen before, exposure. This is something that we saw in a previous lecture. It was a way of measuring how strong an x-ray beam is. We said that the units of exposure are the Rentgen, or R. It's Coulombs per kilogram. It was the amount of charge liberated due to those x-ray beams. If this does not make any sense to you, go back and look at my lectures from chapter five. Right? The whole point of the x-rays, which are indirectly ionizing radiation is they are going to interact with molecules or atoms or something to produce free electrons and ions that's charge that's the directly ionizing radiation and the amount of charge that can be liberated in a certain mass of air or in a patient it'll be tissue is the Rentgen it kind of tells you how strong that x-ray beam is but it doesn't tell you anything about what that charge would actually do to a patient. So we need a new unit. It's called absorbed dose. Sometimes they just say dose. Actually, most of the time they just say dose. But dose or absorbed dose is the amount of radiation energy actually absorbed by a tissue during a patient, by a tumor, whatever, during radiotherapy. I can tell you that the vast amount of time that a medical physicist spends thinking in a clinic is thinking about the concept of dose. That's why this concept here is probably the most important concept that you're going to see in this entire class if you're going on to be a medical physicist. And it's a new concept. You will not see it anywhere else in physics, just in medical physics. So it means that you've, you're going to have to try to get your head around it in these classes right now. So absorbed dose, the amount of radiation therapy 
actually absorbed during radiotherapy. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and let's see what our uh, what what does dose actually do? Well, it's 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 not a physical effect like the Rankin was. This is very physical. Oh, charge liberated, right? That's just coulombs, kilograms of mass. We for dose we need to somehow take biologically significant effects into it. Right, so it's not a physical quantity as much as it's a biological effect on tissue. The idea of absorbed dose is good for measuring all types of ionizing radiations, all energies in all materials. So whereas the Rentgen is really charge produced in air, dose is all ionizing radiations, electrons, positrons, photons of all energies in all materials, in water, in air, in plastics, in tissue, in brain, in stomach whatever the idea of dose is applicable there and essentially it's going to measure how much energy is deposited into each kilogram of tissue so it is going to be an energy per unit mass type of idea but we're going to try to fold in what does that energy actually do once it's in that mash it's a tough thing to measure. I can tell you that, like I said, most of the medical physicists spend a large amount of time thinking about dose because we don't just have an easy way to measure the dose inside a patient. Uh, pharmacists have it easy. What's the dose of acetaminophen I'm giving to you? They weigh it on a scale. Simple. You cannot weigh the amount of dose, which is the damage you're doing to a tumor in a lung. It's a really tricky concept, and this is what makes the medical physics so valuable. We're the only people who understand this idea. So absorbed dose, the exact definition of it is given here. So absorbed dose is sometimes just called dose, and its symbol is capital D for dose. It is really represented, the quantity it's measuring is DE or D epsilon DM, which is the average or mean energy imparted divided by the mass of the material. So the average energy imparted into the material mass, of course, the differential form is d epsilon dm. But if you just knew the total energy transferred over the total material mass, that would be delta E over m, then you would have that idea as well. All right, so that's what dose is measuring. Energy imparted divided by the mass into which you impart it. We're going to need units for it. The unit of dose is given here it's the gray all right this is the new unit when you go to a hospital and you talk to a medical physicist they're going to be talking about grays the the typical uh, a quantity so like again if let me use the pharmacist analogy if you are a pharmacist they are measuring the mass of a compound acetaminophen the unit of mass would be like grams but they really prescribe mass in milligrams so although the unit is grams, their functional unit is milligram. For a medical physicist, the unit is gray, but the functional unit they use is a centigray, one one hundredth of a gray. One hundred centigray equals a gray. That's just the unit that they use. It's the, it's the most convenient subdivision of dose. This is the new unit. There is an old unit that you will encounter. Why do I teach it? Because if you go to nuclear reactors, some of our physicists are working as radiation protection or safety officers. They will use the unit of rad. All right, this is not radian, it's rad. One rad is in a certain unit, it's 100 ergs per gram. This is CGS units. It's 10 to the minus 2 joules per kilogram. This is SI units. So a rad is 10 to the minus 2 joules per kilogram. One gray is 100 rad, which makes it one joule per kilogram. So one rad is about 0.01 gray. All right, the gray is a smaller unit, uh, or it's a bigger unit because it's one joule per kilogram. Can we relate exposure to dose? Roughly, yes. There's not a good one-to-one -one correlation because exposure is really talking about how much charge gets liberated in air. Dose is measuring how much energy gets transferred into a tissue. But roughly, one Rentgen exposure X-ray beam is about one rad of dose. Roughly. It's, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's not a bad idea. So if you knew kind of what the exposure of an X-ray beam, you could estimate how much dose is going into a tissue. 
Uh, well, like I said, that's, there's no calculation you do for that. It's kind of roughly equal. Okay, so this is our new unit of dose, the gray. How much dose, what, is, what, what do those numbers mean? How big are those numbers? Well, if you're treating a tumor, what we need to kill a tumor will be several grays to tens of grays. So this, in my course on radiobiology, we spent a lot of time talking about what these numbers are. All right, so a tumor, a typical, if you have like a lung cancer, the radiation oncologist will prescribe a certain dose of radiation to you, which the medical physicist then has to figure out how to deliver. A typical dose to kill a lung tumor would be 40 gray of radiation, and that might be delivered over 40 days. If you get 40 grays of radiation in one day, you will die. There's no doubt about that. That would be too much. Um, so 100 grays will kill you flat out. One gray will make you quite, quite sick. 10 gray is about the cutoff of what's lethal in one single exposure. A chest x-ray delivers 0.01 to 0.1 milligray. So that, that's a small amount of radiation, but still for medical uh, imaging, that's a lot. Mammogram, one milligray per breast. Look how much bigger a mammogram is than a chest x-ray. That's because all that radiation, and we use a lot of it to get a high resolution image, is kind of concentrated into the breast. A CT is 10 milligray. Right? CT is a full body dose. You're getting way more radiation from a CT than a typical chest x-ray. So this is why you shouldn't be getting uh, random CTs all the time just to see if you're healthy. That amount of dose is not safe. Fluoroscopy, and we've seen several examples of this in our class. This is that real-time x-ray that they use when they're putting in stents, they're putting in shunts, uh, they're looking for uh, myocardial infarctions or blockages of coronary blood uh, vessels. This is 50 milligray or 0.05 gray per minute. This is a high amount of dose. On the other hand, if they're doing fluoroscopy, it's because they need it. They need to see if an implant's going in the right place. They need to see whether you're bleeding or if a stent is in place. So this risk is worth it. Essentially, for you or I, if we're not getting any of these medical treatments, there is radioactive dose in your environment. The law says that 50 milligray is the lowest cumulative annual dose for which there is evidence of radiation-related cancers in adults. It doesn't mean that 40 milligray is safe and 60 milligray is dangerous. That's not true. But we know that because you're going to be exposed to some amount of dose anyways, we'll put a threshold of 50 milligray per year because below that there's no real evidence of radiation-related cancers showing up. So this is a legal definition, but like it or not, when you're dealing with radiation, you have to deal with legal issues. It's just the way it is. All right, so now that we understand the idea of dose, let's talk about how that dose gets delivered into a body. Important, look at this. I've got bold letters and this phrase is huge. So if this does not trip your warning signals that I find this important, then you have not paying attention this semester. This is important. This is the key idea of the whole lecture. The key idea is that the energy imparted to a tissue is not the same as the energy transferred to a tissue by the x-ray beam. They are two different quantities. You need to understand what each of them is. You need to understand what we measure with them and what they do. Key idea for the whole unit. Energy imparted to a tissue. Energy imparted is the same thing as saying absorbed dose. It's the dose that causes damage to the tissue. Energy transferred is going to be defined by something called the kerma, which I'll get to on the next slide. But I just wanted to bring myself back up on the screen and really try to go into the significance of this slide. It's really important. I'm going to describe it in words. You're going to see pictures. You have to come out of this unit understanding it. The point is, the x-ray beam is electromagnetic radiation. It's photons without mass. It's indirectly ionizing radiation. It is going to go into your patient, say your arm. When it does so, some of the energy of the x-ray photons is going to be transferred, converted to kinetic energy of charged particles. We saw that. 
Remember, photoelectric effect, but at 10 MeV, which is therapeutic, it's almost all Compton, right? So at 10 MeV, the Compton effect dominates. So go back and review Compton scattering. It's an X-ray photon coming in. It liberates a free electron, and an X-ray photon scatters off. That free electron has kinetic energy. If you add up the kinetic energy, that's how much energy gets transferred to the tissue. Now you have the X-rays are gone. You've got these fast-moving electrons from all these Compton scattering events. Do those electrons damage the tissue or not? Some of them will. Some will not. That loss of energy due to the electrons is called the energy imparted. It's the energy imparted from the electrons and that's going to give absorbed dose. So energy transferred is the energy of electromagnetic energy being transferred to the kinetic energy of electrons. Energy imparted is the kinetic energy of the electrons being delivered, imparted into the dose which causes damage to the tissue. All right, this is not that complicated an idea because I've explained it and the slide is simple, but every year so many students do not bother to get this idea straight and then they get it wrong when I ask questions on it, which I love to do because it's the key idea. So you've got to make it make some sense for yourself. All right, so we've introduced ourselves to the idea of absorbed dose, which is the energy imparted what is the energy transferred, which is KERMA? So let us talk about that idea. What is KERMA? KERMA is an, acro uh, it's an acronym of sorts. So it's usually written this way, not always with a capital K, K-E-R-M-A, but usually an acronym would have capital letters because it is an acronym of sorts. Kinetic energy released in the medium. This is how you know what KERMA is. Absorbed dose has nothing to do with kinetic energy. KERMA is the transfer of energy from the electromagnetic photons to the kinetic energy of the charged particles in the medium. KERMA, it tells you in the name what it is. But I said it's an acronym of sort because we have K-E-R-M. What about the A? Well, you guys are very, very fortunate to be taking a medical physics class in Canada because almost all of the pioneering work in radiation therapy was done in Toronto, Canada in the 50s. And so it is sometimes said that this acronym actually is the kinetic energy released in the medium, eh? Because this is the Canadians who came up with all this idea. And so this A is our Canadian colloquialism, A, KERMA, kinetic energy released in the medium, eh? So I say it's an acronym of sorts, but we think that this is true. And again, it is true that almost all of the pioneering work in this radiation therapy was done uh, in Toronto. Um, it was a, 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 the center of medical physics in the world at the time. So KERMA is defined by symbol K. It is the energy transferred divided by the mass into which that energy is transferred. How much energy was converted from electromagnetic to kinetic energy divided by in how much mass did that take place? To define what we mean by DE transferred, so DE transferred equals DE just transferred, sub TR. This is the sum of the initial kinetic energies of all the charged ionizing particles electrons or positrons, these are charged ionizing particles with mass liberated or set in motion by the uncharged particles, photons. So photons do not have kinetic energy. They only have electromagnetic energy. They are uncharged. They are indirectly ionizing radiation. Via Compton scattering, they are going to interact with atoms and molecules and liberate charged particles, mostly electrons, but sometimes positrons. If you sum up the initial kinetic energies of all those charged particles, which have mass and are directly ionizing radiation, that will be this DE tra transferred, the sum of the initial kinetic energies of all the charged particles. DM is obviously the mass of the material in the medium. Medium. So all of this, if all of this occurs in one gram of water, for example, then dm is just one gram. 
but you have to sum up the initial kinetic energies of the massive charged ionizing particles. How much energy kinetic did you get going due to interacting with the X-ray beam? That's a really key idea. So the units of Kerma, because this is energy per unit mass, is actually joules per kilogram. So Kerma has units of joules per kilogram. But Kerma is not a gray, which also is actually joules per kilogram, because gray is reserved for dose. So Kerma is joules per kilogram. Absorbed dose is joules per kilogram, but we call that special one joule per kilogram of dose, we call that a gray. That way you always know, are you talking about dose, which is grays, or are you talking about kerma, which is joules per kilogram? So we use different units to keep those things separate from each other. All right, so it's a really important idea now that you're seeing that there's kerma on the one hand, joules per kilogram, dose on the other, which is grays. Kerma, energy transferred to the medium via your photon beam. Once all those things are done, of the energy of those particles, the ionizing particles, how much of that energy goes into damaging the tissue? Dose. Measure that in grays. All right. Let's go on and let me show you an example of what I'm talking about with that. So I think you're all going to remember this acronym now. That's great. Here's our picture. Here's our simple, simple picture. So again, I've been talking about a slab of water. Here it is. Let's say we know the mass of all this water, this BM, the denominator, uh, in all of our equations we've been using. Here's an X-ray photon beam coming from the left. It is going to come into the, ish come into the tissue, and there's going to be an interaction. All right. This interaction could be one specific Compton event if you want. All right. Out of the Compton event comes a fast electron, which is useful, and a scattered photon, which is useless. That's why I say some of the photon energy, but not all, is transferred to a material and sets charged particles in motion. The photon energy gets converted to kinetic energy of the electron and another scattered photon. That's why it's some, but not all. Some of the energy goes into the kinetic energy of the electrons. We love that because it's useful. Some of it goes into a scattered photon, which is useless. If the charged particles are not set in motion, this is just completely wasted energy, and it's not useful to a medical physicist at all because it's going to be these electrons that do the damage. The massive charged electrons do damage to the cancers, which is what we want it to do. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. So this event right here was energy transferred. What is the initial kinetic energy of this red line? That's the energy transferred. Now, what does that electron do as it goes through? Some of that energy that gets transferred is re-radiated as other photons right here. These are, again, useless. So not all of this kinetic energy gets imparted to the tissue. This is why the energy imparted, which is dose, is less than the kinetic energy that gets going or the energy transferred. Because whatever energy you transfer, which is some fraction of this initial energy, whatever energy is transferred, some fraction of that actually goes into the dose and is useful. The other part of that fraction is re-radiated as photons, which is, again, useless. All right. So that's why in the multiple choice question I gave you, we saw that the energy imparted is less than the energy transferred. That's just the way it goes. All right. So really important idea that I need you to understand is energy transferred, energy imparted. This is kerma. This is dose. One is bigger than the other, and neither one of them is as big as the original energy in the x-ray beam, because it can't be. You're losing a little bit of energy at every step. All right. So this very important slide then from Hobby. If you can understand this slide, you really, really understand what we're talking about. All right, so pay particular attention on this slide. Let me take you through it. This slide from Hobby is showing two different cases. Up here, you have got one 10 MeV photon coming in and something happens. Down here, you've got another 10 MeV photon coming in, and something happens. It's two separate things, but we're using it to illustrate two different things. 
So let's just talk about those two things. Kerma occurs at a point. It is a point process. The kerma occurs at the point where the photon sets an electron in motion. All right. Remember, it's a Compton scattering event. It's a single event. It occurs at a point in space. Photon coming in, photon going out, electron going out. Let's look at this case at the bottom. 110 MeV photon. It passes, so this is a 10 centimeter slab, and I've broken it up into 10 one centimeter slices. Photon goes through. Does it interact in the first light? It does not. This is all random. You would roll dice every time. It's got some probability of interacting. It did not interact with the first slice. Does nothing. Goes through the second slice. It does not interact in the second slice. Does nothing. Gets into the third slice. Okay, now this is indicating an interaction. See this event right here? This number here, 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 here is the kinetic energy. So at this point in space and time, it liberated an electron with energy 8.75 MeV. It's a Compton scattering event, so it also liberated a 1.25 MeV electron, a photon going off in this direction. Now this photon may do something up here, but we're ignoring it for now. So energy has been conserved. 10 went into 1.25 MeV into 8.5 8.75 MeV here. So in this track, how much energy was transferred in this slice? Nothing. How much energy was transferred in this slice? Nothing. How much energy was transferred into this slice? 8.75, the initial kinetic energy of the particles. Okay. Continue on. Now you have a fast electron and it starts to slow down. Its kinetic energy when it reaches the beginning of the slice was 8.1, then 6.5, 4.5, How much energy gets transferred in each of these slices? None, because energy transferred is when a photon transfers energy to a charged particle, and I said we're ignoring this guy. All that's left is the charged particle. The energy transfer was a point process. It occurred right here. In this beam up here, it occurs right here. This is now just a fast electron slowing down, 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 down. Now we want to calculate the energy imparted, which is dose. Energy imparted, or dose, is the difference in kinetic energies. All right, so if it had 8.1 MeV when it started, and it has 6.5 MeV when it leaves, clearly it lost 1.6 MeV of energy. All right, as it went from there to there. Uh, let's just take a, the, the numbers that it's showing here for energy imparted is the sum of these two processes. Let's just look out here. You had an electron here. It came into this slice. It had 4.5 MeV. It left with 2.5 MeV. It's 2 MeV slower. So the energy imparted, which is dose, is 2 MeV in that slice. It entered this slice with 2.5. It left with 0 0.2, 2.5. Minus 0 0.2 is 2.3. The energy imparted into this slice, which is dose, is 2.3 MeV. It entered with 0 0.2, and then it comes to rest. Energy imparted in this slice is 0 0.2. So this, these numbers at the bottom are summing what's going on here and what's going on here. So let's take a look at this top slice and see if it makes sense. You've got 110 MeV photon coming in. Now look. You've got a 5.4 particle generated here and a 3.6 MeV particle generated here. What could this possibly be with no scattered photon? Oh, this is a pair production event. You generated, say, an electron with 5.4 MeV. You generated a positron with 3.6 MeV. 3.6 plus 5.4 is 9. That's because it required 1 MeV of energy to create the electron-positron pair. The rest mass energies of these guys are 500 keV. It's 511, right? 511 keV plus 511 keV is essentially 1 MeV. So that energy was lost due to creating the particles, and now you have a fast electron and a fast positron. 
the initial kinetic energy of the electron was 5.4. The initial en kinetic energy of the positron was 3.6. 5.4 plus 3.6 is 9. The energy transferred in this slice is 9. The initial kinetic energies. It was 5.4 at the beginning, 4.5 at the end. The electron has lost 0 0.9 MeV of energy. It was three. The positron had 3.6 and 2.0, so it has lost 1.6. So 1.6 plus 0 0.9 means the total energy imparted in that slice was 2.5 MeV, right? So the point is, energy imparted is dose, and dose is distributed along the line. So as the electron comes to rest, it's continually skidding to a stop. It's continually losing energy. And so the change in kinetic energy from the start to the end of the slab is the dose, and it's delivered continuously over that slab. So the key idea of this thing is KERMA is a point process. It occurs at one particular point in space and time where the electron gets going. And once you know that, it's done. But dose is all along the track as that electron starts to slow down. It's distributed along a line, and that's what makes it do damage. All right, so again, that's the really key idea to this whole slide, is that one, if you know the initial kinetic energies of the charged particles, which I will always tell you, you know the energy transferred, and you need to remember energy transferred is kerma. Same physical idea, different words. So if you know the initial kinetic energies of those particles, then you know the energy transferred. Once you know that, you know exactly where the kerma occurred, then you could ignore kerma. All the rest now is how long does it take that electron to skid to a stop? And the dose is going to be distributed along that entire path. And for that, you need to know kind of the beginning kinetic energy and the end kinetic energy. Whatever kinetic energy it lost divided by the mass, that's the dose. And so the dose, you can see the energy imparted is not constant throughout here. It just means that even if there's one electron moving through a patient, it doesn't deliver equal dose at equal places because it's going to be interacting with the patient in a, di in a different way. So are the kerma and dose related? Meaning are the energy transfer and the energy imparted related? Sure they are because all the energy that is delivered as dose comes from the energy transferred. So they're not independent of each other. They just occur at different points in space and time. The energy is transferred here, and then this thing skids to a stop, and so the dose is delivered here. The total dose is going to depend on how much was transferred, but they occur at different points in space and time. All right. So how are they related? Here's a very important slide. All right. So this is going to be a really important slide. Let me just get rid of this thing because that's confusing. How are dose and kerma related? This is, again, a really important idea. This was in one of your multiple choice questions that I asked of you. Why is dose not maximized at the surface? You have to really think hard to understand this. If you can understand it, you're in very good shape. The kerma is maximum right at the surface and continually decreases. Okay, so the kerma is because this x-ray beam comes in. Right at the surface, you have the maximum interaction of the x-ray beam and the tissue to generate electrons. So the kerma energy transferred is maximized, and then it gets weaker as you go into the patient. Why does the kerma get weaker? Think about that. Why would the kerma go down through the patient? Kerma is the energy liberated, transferred to an electron via an x-ray beam. Every time that happens, you're losing x-ray photons out of the beam. The x-ray beam is attenuated due to these Compton scattering events, which are generating electrons. Because there are fewer x-ray photons left, the kerma has to decrease. Right? They are just as efficient at generating electrons. There are fewer of them. So if you look on the screen, that kerma is kind of decreasing in a line because the number of x-rays available to transfer their energy decreases due to the attenuation. So that number has to go down 
and that should make sense to you. But now look at what the dose does. I, I told you this, that you would think that the dose is maximized at the surface. Here's the key idea. It cannot be. I told you, in theory, the dose is zero right at the surface. So the kerma is the energy transferred to get fast electrons going. It's maximum at the surface. Why is the dose not maximum at the surface? Pause it now and ask yourself that question. I'll come back, and if you know the answer, then you really understand it. So pause it now. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to think about it, and I hope you took it seriously, because thinking and relating new information is hard work, guys. You've got to spend some time thinking about it. If, if you think you're going to learn by me just telling you, it doesn't work that way. You've got to struggle. You've got to grapple. Try to form a mental construct of how you're putting information together. And this key idea, why is absorbed dose, in theory, zero at the surface, and it's larger slightly below the surface? It goes to the question of what is dose? Dose is the energy imparted into a tissue as the electrons lose energy and skid to a stop. Right at the surface of the tissue, how many electrons have skidded to a stop? None. None. They are set in motion at the surface. The most number of them are maximized at the surface. None of them have had a chance yet to slow down and lose energy in the tissue. That is what dose is. So at the surface, there's zero dose. None of the electrons have had any chance to lose their energy yet. It takes a while. You have to get down into the surface. So all this huge electron shower that gets generated at the surface, it comes down and then it starts to give up its energy. And then it's maximized at some depth below the surface and we call that depth a build-up region very important idea radiotherapy you can't just beam x-rays onto a person and expect it to kill stuff on the surface you've got to get the electrons moving or positrons but it's mostly electrons you get the electrons moving through kerma and then as they lose their energy that will deliver the dose it takes some amount of depth into the tissue for the electrons to deliver that dose as they start to slow down so the dose quickly rises to a maximum. It rises over what we call the buildup region. And then, sure, it will start to decrease later on into the tissue, right? So the dose will get lower because the kerma, the number of electrons that are causing it, is getting lower and lower and lower. So basically what's happening with the dose is just dependent on what happens upstream. We always say that. It's a downstream effect that's always like a half millimeter or a millimeter behind what's going on upstream with the kerma. So as the total number of electrons getting generated decreases, eventually the dose must decrease. But it's following it, always dependent on, if you kind of want to know what is the dose here, you need to know what was the kerma a millimeter upstream. And that kind of tells you what's happening, right? Because it takes a while for the electrons to skid to a stop. Does that make some kind of sense? If it doesn't, write down your questions. Let's talk about it, all right? But you've got some readings and you've got some PowerPoint slides that should be able to get through it. Here's just another way of looking at it. So this buildup region here is where the dose comes up. So again, this is a different graph. Does this graph look different than this graph? It does. Different books use different ways of relating it. But the truth of what's going on is always the same. The kerma is this blue line, K, maximum at the surface, linearly decreasing, essentially. Now, those of you who remember the exponential attenuation of x-rays might wonder why is this linear if it's really it's because at, at most of the depths there's not enough attenuation to really look exponential so approximating it linearly is just fine although the actual equation is exponential attenuation i get that but usually we just draw the kerma decreasing linearly because the x-ray beam does not decrease that much in the body there is a build-up region up to some maximum point once you get beyond the buildup region, you've got a maximum dose, and it'll start to decrease after that. And we call this the, remember this idea of electronic equilibrium, equal numbers of electrons coming in as going out. This is the same idea as what's shown on the slide. The equilibrium, equilibrium region is that region where there's just as many electrons kind of coming in and slowing down as are being generated and going out. 
And so on this graph, the slope of the decrease in D and the slope of the decrease in K is the same out in these regions. And that was true out here too, right? So the fact that these slopes are the same, that's not a coincidence, all right? Because you're in the region of e electronic equilibrium. So are some things getting to a stop in that region from what happened upstream? Yeah, they are. But you're generating electrons in that region as well, which are then leaving the region and affecting it downstream. So they're mirroring each other. But like I said, what's going on in the dose is kind of dependent upon what happened upstream just a little bit. So dose and kerma are certainly related in that way. There's no equations to any of this. Remember, I told you that. I'm not going to give you any equations. You don't need to know equations. The data is tabulated for what's going on inside the body. You need to understand what it's doing to be able to understand those calculations and tabulations. Okay? So two more ideas now. I want to talk about this idea. RBE, relative biologic effect. All right, so relative biologic effect is now something that we're going to do. We're going to expand on the idea of dose. So RBE is going to take into account of the fact that not all radiation, although the energies are the same, damages tissue the same way. So RBE is a ratio. It's a ratio of the dose of a standard particle, and the standard particle is not just any random standard particle. It's specifically 200 keV X-ray photons. So that is our standard. What damage or dose will a 200 keV X-ray photon deliver? And then we'll look at everything compared to that. All right. So the ratio of the dose of a standard particle to the dose of some other type of radiation both of which cause the same amount of biologic damage. So we're asking you, for the same amount of damage, what dose of 200 keV X-ray photons do you need? And what dose of alpha rays do you need? All right, because it's not going to be the same. Let me give you an example. This sounds confusing. As I'm saying it, I'm realizing this sounds confusing. It's actually not. It's a pretty simple concept. We want some amount of biologic damage. You're allowed to specify. Let's say the effect is 100% tumor control, right? So we have some effect, and you could be like, how much radiation do you need to destroy a kidney? Uh, in this case, I'm saying, how much radiation do you need to get 100% of tumor control? We don't ever say tumors are killed, by the way. There is no curing cancer. There is no killing cancer. They talk about tumor control, which means that as far as you can tell, you've eliminated all the cancerous cells and they're not coming back. But that's only control, it's not killing or curing. So 100% tumor control is what you want. If it takes 40 gray of 200 keV x-rays to get 100% tumor control, oh, but it only takes you 20 gray of Razy particles, which one's more damaging? Well, it took you 40 of these, it took you 20 of only 20 of these. Clearly, the Razy particles are more damaging than the KEV, 200 keV x-rays, right? That's right. So the ratio here is 2. 40 grays of 200 keV x-rays were required. 20 grays of radio Razy particles. So the ratio was 2. So the RBE, the relative biologic effect of the Razy particles, is equal to 2. The Razy particles are twice as damaging as the 200 kV x-rays because you only required half the dose to do the same job. Okay, So that's all the RBE means. All x-rays will be R RBE of 1. So just remember, RBE of 2 means they're twice as damaging. You only need half the dose. RBE of 0 0.5 is half as damaging. You would require twice the dose. So as I was saying this, I told you, this sounded confusing, but it's really not. Why? Because it's a ratio that tells you how much better the 200 kV x-rays are at killing things. And there's only three numbers you need to remember because there's not an infinite number of radiation particles. There's x-rays, all x-rays, all gamma rays, all electrons are RBE equals 1. What could be simpler? All x-rays, all gamma rays, all beta rays are RBE equals 1. Alpha particles are the heaviest particles. They're super damaging. They have RBE of 20. So if you required 40 gray of x-rays to kill a tumor, 
with an RBA of 20, you would only require two grays of alphas. They're so much more devastating to the tissue. Neutrons are kind of tunable. They have an RBE that goes between 5 and 20. But if you just told me 5, that would be fine. So usually the numbers I remember is 1, 5, 20. And that works out pretty well. I think the surprising thing about this chart is this one right here. I cannot tell you, pay attention please, I cannot tell you the number of times where I've had every student in class say, yep, I get this. And then on a final exam, I say, oh, if it requires um, 40 gray of 200 kV x-rays, um, what, how, what, uh, how many 800 keV x-rays does it require? And a student says, oh, 200 keV x-rays, 800 keV, well, that's four times more energy, so that must be four times more damaging, so it only requires 10 gray. Uh, literally every, I'm telling you, every year about half the class gets that question wrong. And just like I told them, I will tell you. I have no problem doing that. I say it in class. I guarantee you, half of you are going to get this question wrong. I'm saying it flat out. And I say that every year, and in no year has it ever changed the number of students who get this question wrong. I don't know why. It's Actually, I do know why. It's because you're approaching learning, and you're not really thinking about it. I say and say and say, and you write and write and write, and then I ask you questions, and you're like, oh, yes, Dr. Azy, sure. But you're not thinking about it. Because deep in your mind, you still know an 800 kV photon is four times more damaging than a 200 kV photon. Damn what Razy says. You don't care. You know that that's true. And you're wrong. And so when I ask the question, you answer the question, and you're wrong. Because you haven't taken time to undo what you thought would make sense. I get it. It makes sense that a more energetic x-ray should be more damaging. It turns out they are not. All x-rays do the same amount of damage. So a 100 keV x-ray, a 1 MeV x-ray, it's not 10 times more damaging. It's all the same. It's a little counterintuitive, but it's true. All right. The alpha particles are different and the neutrons are different, but all x-rays and gamma rays and all betas are all RBE1. Very simple to remember. It doesn't matter what their energy is. That's fortunate for us. Because when we do the radiotherapy, you're allowed to pick the energies that will travel through the body best, but it doesn't change the dose you're delivering. So we're really, we're happy about that. Okay? So very important to understand this idea of RBE, relative biologic effect. So now, if we have this idea that the dose is different, so if it only takes 40 gray to control the tumor if you're using x-ray photons, but it took 20 gray of Razy particles, then how, what does that unit mean? It seems like we should have a new unit to incorporate the fact that, wow, these are damaging, and these are not as damaging. Well, we do, so you have another unit that you have to learn. Let's get to that. It's called the dose equivalent. So it's the idea of dose equivalent. You take the absorbed dose in gray, you multiply it by the RBE, which is unitless, and that gives you a new unit of a quantity we call dose equivalent, which is then sieverts. So sievert is the new unit, or rem, which is the old unit. Just like before, we saw gray was the new unit of dose, and rad was the old unit of dose. We now have sievert is the new unit of dose equivalent, and REM, which is the old unit of dose equivalent. So gray is dose. Dose equivalent says, okay, just exactly what the word means. How equivalent is the dose of one radiation relative to the dose of the other? Let's take the Razy particles, for example. If you delivered 20 gray of 200 keV x-rays, that would be 20 times 1. That would be the equivalent, dose equivalent, of 20 sieverts. But 20 gray of Razy particles, which are twice as damaging, because they have an RBE of 2, would be 40 sieverts. Right? It's a way of incorporating the fact that it is more damaging. 
right? And that makes sense because we want it. So the gray is like the absolute energy imparted per unit mass. It's independent of the damage, but we need to know the damage. So if you're talking about how much damage is inflicted, we use the dose equivalent idea with a unit of sievert. So we use WR, which is a radiation weighting factor. So I know I taught you about RBE. That's the way Kane does it. Really in medical physics, RBE, it's, it's basically RBE, but there's just another way of describing it called uh, the radiation, oh, there we go, huh, the radiation weighting factor, uh, W sub R. Oh, that's kind of funny. Uh, so W sub R is the radiation weighting factor. It, it, it essentially is RBE, but it's not quite the same. Uh, another book that I was accessing called it uh, D times Q, a quality factor. So there's really RBE, radiation weighting factor, Q, the quality factor. It's all the same thing. How damaging is that tissue? So where dose is D, measured in gray, dose equivalent is H, measured in sievert. Dose, D, grays, dose equivalent, H, sieverts. And like I said, the new unit is a sievert, which is 100 rem, and one rem then is 0 0.01 sieverts. Why do you need to know both? Because if you're looking at an old book for help, or if you go, again, if you're working, uh, I just recently toured the Fermi nuclear power plant over in Michigan, everything over there, it was all rads and rems still. So it seems like in the nuclear industry, rad and rem is prevalent. Uh, if you go to a hospital and talk to our medical physicists, they're always gonna be talking about grays and sieverts. Um, radiation safety people, it's kind of somewhere in the middle, actually. But usually when they're talking about exposure due to nuclear events, they are going to be talking about sieverts because, you know, you, you want to know whether you're actually being damaged uh, or not. So um, that's the idea uh, of now. So we're basically done uh, with the lecture. So I hope that made some sense to you all. Again, a couple critical ideas. Be looking at my notes by the lecture. Um, this this lecture was is so critical to understanding all of radiotherapy. I, I, I think maybe this is the most important lecture of the entire class. Understanding dose, understanding kerma. How does the energy get transferred to a patient? How does that transferred energy then get imparted into tissues? How do we quantify that? How do we try to quantify damage that occurs? Um, critical idea, absolutely critical to all medical physics. So I hope some of this made sense. I hope your reading made sense. I hope watching this with me and going through it helped you make some sense of it. As always, if you have questions, write them down. We can talk during office hours. You can get on your, your uh, audio or video in the Blackboard once we do it. And you can let me have those questions. We'll go through it together until I explain it in a way that makes sense to you. So I hope that's all working out. So Good luck, everybody, and I will talk to you next time, all right?